G'day, I'm Tristan. I go to the 10 o'clock service here at Lawson Anglican. This is our church service over the internet. Welcome if you've been in our pre-church Zoom call where we've been chatting, hanging out. I assure you if you've missed out on it, there's going to be one after. You can join in and we'll be able to hang out together as a church, not separated across time like we are now, but instead all at the same time. Uh, we're going to go into a song now, which will be How Great Is Our God? As you know, the Israelites had been taken far from home to Babylon, including a young man named Daniel and his friends, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah. They studied the language and culture of Babylon and were taken to serve the king, the mighty Nebuchadnezzar. In the second year, Nebuchadnezzar had bad dreams. He couldn't sleep and he was worried. The king had a whole bunch of wise men who liked to tell him what dreams mean. 
magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers. So the king called them and said, I had a bad dream and I want to know the meaning. His advisors said, what was it? The king said, you tell me. You say you know so much. You can tell me the meaning of my dream. So you should be able to tell me what I dreamed. And if you can't, I'll chop you up and break your houses into little pieces. The advisors said, please tell us. The king said, no, I've made up my mind. If you don't tell me what I dreamed, I'll know you just tell me lies. Tell me what I dreamed. The advisors said, no one can do what the king says. No one knows what people dream except gods and gods don't live here. The king was furious and he ordered that all the wise men in the entire kingdom should be killed, including Daniel and his friends. Daniel spoke to the commander carefully. Why is the king's command so harsh? The commander explained. Daniel went to see the king and asked for him to wait one night so Daniel could explain the dream. Daniel went home and told Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah what had happened. They prayed all night that God would have mercy and show them the dream. And God did. Daniel thanked God who knows all mysteries and is powerful over everything. In the morning, Daniel went to the king. Don't kill anyone. I know what the dream means. The king said, did you work it out? Daniel said, no human, no matter how wise or powerful, knows these things. But God in heaven reveals mysteries and he has showed you what's going to happen in the future and he showed me so I could tell you. You saw a huge statue. Its head was gold. Its chest and arms were silver. Its belly and thighs were bronze and its legs iron and its feet iron mixed with clay. Then you saw a rock cut, not by a human and it smashed the statue and blew all the pieces away. But the rock became a mountain and filled the earth. Here's what it means. You, your majesty, are king of kings. God has made you ruler over almost everything. He gave you might and power and glory. You are the head of gold. After you will come another kingdom, not quite as good. Then there will be a bronze one. After that, there will be a kingdom strong like iron, smashing everything like iron does. Like the statue, iron so strong mixed with clay that cracks. This kingdom will have cracks that make it weak. The iron makes it strong, but the people will be divided. In those times, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never end and will crush all those other kingdoms. That's what the dream of the rock cut out of a mountain means. And God has shown you. The king fell to the floor in front of Daniel. Your God is God of gods and king of kings who uncovers mysteries. The king gave Daniel lots of gifts and put him in charge of all the wise men. And he made Daniel's friends officials of the province while Daniel served the king. Daniel knew that the king, so powerful and angry, was not truly in charge. The power he had was given to him by God. So when things got really bad, Daniel prayed to God asking for help. And God was with him, helping him show people that God is in charge. God gives wisdom and God is faithful to those who trust him. He never leaves them 
or forget them. Thank you, Alison. You've really painted a picture for us. Don't let your kids go. We've got a whole bunch of goodies up on the website. You can download. The show is not over for them. Their sermon might not be as entertaining for them, but the stuff we've got, a whole bunch of printouts and what have you, uh, on the website, you can download that, check it out, have fun, keep engaged. In other news concerning kids, we have a new addition to the roster with the introduction of Samuel Kersop, Uh, which is very exciting news and everybody should be reacting like Tom and Brendan. Uh, it is really exciting to know that it is safely alive. Uh, the stats have been posted to Facebook, uh, but congratulations to James and Fiona and please everyone be praying for them as they adjust to life with a small one. And further, stick around after church. We have our Zoom calls as we've had in previous weeks. I've really enjoyed them. We break out into rooms. So you don't have to look at like 30 people. You can look at six people and chat and catch up. And I think it's a really important time for us as a church because we can hang out, chat, and actually catch up on what's going on and get to know each other and keep up with what's going on in our lives, which is really important when we're socially distancing and paying attention to our health that we don't be socially isolated. It's good to keep up and know what's going on. In the coming weeks, we're gonna be putting a series of videos up on our Facebook feed. These videos are gonna be about Jesus and answering the big questions that other people have about him. If you're a Christian, I'd highly commend them to you because they're a great way to become reacquainted with the reasons we do what we do and believe what we believe. And also a good way to better learn how to express what we do and why we do it and what we believe. Because sometimes it can be really hard to find the right words to say. If you're not a Christian, I'd commend it to you because we have some seriously good news and we'd love to share it with you. And we think it's really compelling and life-changing. So please check it out, have a look and enjoy. If you've been contributing to the Anglicae collection, thank you. Uh, but if you're wanting to, uh, hurry up because there's a deadline coming along. This Wednesday is the final date for additions to that collection. So if you want to be part of that, uh, hurry up or you'll miss out. Next up, we've got a Bible reading and then the sermon. Becky will be taking the Bible reading and Tom will be taking the sermon. Hi, I'm Becky Almozar, I'm from the 10 o'clock service, and I'm going to be reading to you from Luke chapter 13, verses 10 to 21. Jesus heals a crippled woman on the Sabbath. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you were set free from your infirmary. Then he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue leader said to the people, There are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. The Lord answered him, You hypocrites! Doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? When he said this, all his opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. The Parables of the Mustard Seed and the Yeast Then Jesus asked, What is the kingdom of God like? What shall I compare it to? It is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his garden, it grew up and became a tree, and the birds perched in its branches. And again he asked, What shall I compare the kingdom of God to? It is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 30 kilograms of flour until it worked all through the dough. Well, g'day everyone. Great to be back together. About to be back in God's Word. I hope you're looking forward to learning a bit more about Jesus today. Uh, our lives 
are in general pretty chock full of happy things, full of things that bring a smile to our faces, a quick happy thought to our minds. Uh, that kind of happiness you can actually buy. But finding a true delight, that's a much rarer thing, right? Delight is next level happiness. Delight is when the happiness comes and you know it's going to last. Delight is when the happiness comes and it changes everything. It really means something. Delight is, I suspect, what James and Fiona, our brother and sister here at church, are experiencing right now with the birth of their little boy Samuel this week. Delight is what all of us started experiencing on Friday when we were at last able to go and visit each other in our homes, maintaining distance, of course, but, but nice to be able to be back together visiting each other again. Our, our lives are chock full of happy things, but delights are a whole lot rarer, I think. And in this next little bit of Luke's Gospel, this, this recounting of the key parts of Jesus' life and his ministry, uh, we get to see that Jesus brought delights. Not, not just quick, fleeting, smile happiness, but actually rather that kind of deep-seated delight of knowing that what you've now seen, what you've now experienced, what you've now understood will mean that your life will never be the same again. Now, Becky read it for us a few minutes back, and in verse 17 of that passage, you get this summary of the impact that Jesus was having on everybody around him. Chapter 13, verse 17, it says, When he said this, all his opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. He's having this polarizing effect. Some people are being humiliated, but it's bringing absolutely deep delight to others. What's, what's he doing? What's bringing this about? Well, we'll jump back to the start. We'll, we'll read it. Back up to verse 10. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over, could not straighten up at all. At this point, we are back to regular old village life with Jesus. Uh, Jesus chose to do most of his ministry in small backwater villages with ordinary folk. Uh, and at this point, he's teaching in a synagogue. You know, this group of Jewish men and women and children would have been gathered, uh, they've come together, and Jesus has been invited to speak to them. Uh, it's the regular day for this. It's the Sabbath day, we're told. Uh, Sabbath, if you are unsure, uh, starts at sundown on Friday night, goes through till sundown on Saturday night, and it's this God-given time to down tools and stop working for a bit so that you can remember your Creator, so that you can rest in Him. Uh, to this day, in modern-day Israel, the sirens ring out across the, the place about an hour before sunset on Friday, just to remind you that you need to get everything done that needs to be done so that when Sabbath kicks in, you can stop. And then that night, after dinner, families will walk down to their local synagogue and they'll gather together and they'll hear teaching together and they'll, and they'll pray together and they'll sing together. Now, that's what's going on here. It's a Friday night. Jesus is there, he's teaching away. And suddenly he spots a woman in the congregation. Now, there she is, he sees her and she's clearly in a bad way. We get told that she's bent over could not straighten up at all, and that she's been like this, been in this kind of physical predicament for 18 years, not good at all. Now, Jesus sees this woman, and he doesn't just kind of make a mental note to kind of grab her after the service ends. No, instead he says, right now, come forward. He calls her up. Right there in front of everybody watching on, she comes up. This, whatever he does is going to be public. And he says to her, woman, you are set free from your infirmity. And he places his hands on her and straight away, boom, just like that, she's able to stand up straight and walk straight for the first time in nearly two decades. And, and of course, she, she starts praising God, as you would do, publicly for all to hear. Because this is clearly, obviously, the kind of healing that only God can bring about, just like that. And so, in one sense, it's really easy to see why the watching crowds were delighted. Jesus is welcoming us, welcoming you and me, into a kingdom of delights. And we get to see a whole stack of them here, just in this little interaction. There's the delight of seeing this God-driven healing. There's the delight of, of getting a little glimpse, getting a little foretaste of the promised future, where everything gets put right. Where, where hunched over backs and sickness and, and, and death are no longer part of things. 
There's the delight of seeing this beautiful combo of ultimate power and delightful compassion all wrapped up in the same person of Jesus. There's the delight of knowing that the troubles of this life do not mean that our world is spiralling out of control. That there is someone there behind it all who can be trusted. For these people back in this synagogue on that day, there was the delight of seeing this woman who they'd known for years, loved for years, finally be set free from her plight. Jesus comes along, he enters into our stories and he just delivers delight after delight. But there's more to this delight, more than just the delights that come out of this demonstration of the healing. We, along with the watching crowds that day, we can be utterly delighted by the way Jesus on this occasion, chooses to put religious hypocrisy in its place, that place being the bin. This delightful healing, as we know, takes place on the Sabbath and it takes place in a synagogue and it takes place by the guy who's giving the sermon, which means that it sets off all sorts of alarm bells for the Jewish religious leader in that synagogue. Verse 14, we read about it. It says, indignant Because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue leader said to the people, there are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. He launches into this attack, telling off the woman and telling off Jesus, but not directly to their faces. No, no, he's way more passive-aggressive than that. And funnily enough, he's not actually angry about the healing itself. I'm guessing that he, like everybody else, thought this is really kind of cool. But the big issue is... This happened on the Sabbath. That's the reason he's getting all cranky pants at this point, the day it happened on. He says to the crowds, if this is the kind of thing you want, if this kind of healing is what you're desiring, then come and get it on any other day of the week. There are six days for doing all sorts of work, but the Sabbath is not the day for this. AKA, Jesus, what you just did was wrong. And it sure seems to me that Jesus knew exactly what he was getting into when he did this. He knew exactly that he was going to be getting into this kind of argy-bargy argument. After all, it's not as though the woman walked up the front of the synagogue and asked Jesus to be healed. No, he saw her, he brought her out, he healed her publicly in front of the leaders. He invited this challenge because... He wanted to be able to challenge the hypocrisy of these men, to call it out in public, to give the people watching on the joy and the delight of realising that their loveless, ruthless twisting of God's good laws was not actually right. Jesus hears this challenge that, that the Sabbath day wasn't the day for this healing. And he responds in verse 15, the Lord answered him, you hypocrites, Doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? These leaders had given the impression that the Sabbath day was dishonoured, rubbished, if any person was offered help on that day. And if that's what you're hearing as a a member of a synagogue from the lips of your religious leaders, then what does that make you think about God? That that on His day, He says it's wrong for you to help anybody. That that, that this God wants you to suppress all compassion on this day of the week in in the name of keeping His rule about rest. If that were true, then that'd be something pretty weird and twisted to believe about God. That it leads you to thinking all sorts of unhelpful things about God. But it's not true. And Jesus challenges it. He challenges this synagogue leader. He asks, don't you go every Sabbath day and untie your donkey or untie your ox so that it can walk on out and eat some food and get some water? The answer being, yes, of course. That is exactly what they do. They wouldn't just allow their animals to die of hunger or die of thirst just because it's the Sabbath day. They know deep down that God's Sabbath day was never intended to make life harder, was never intended to be kind of perpetuating suffering. 
And the challenge from Jesus, of course, is so then why would you put that kind of burden on others? Why would you say it's okay for me to care for my donkey, but it's not okay for you to care for this woman? This daughter of Abraham who's been trapped by Satan for 18 years, it just doesn't make sense. He's got him there, right? And he knows it. There's no counter-argument for this. Which means, as we're told, that this leader of the synagogue and all the other opponents of Jesus who were there that day, they ended up being humiliated that night because of their hypocrisy, because of how much they had botched their understanding of the Sabbath, because of how much they had botched their representation of what God is like. This this attitude of heavy-handed rule-keeping Without grace, without love, without compassion, the the kind of rule-keeping that this leader was arguing for, not only was he not really practicing it, but it's also a massively deceptive representation of what God is like. And so when Jesus calls him out on it, the crowds, understandably, go wild with delight. They're delighted at the wonderful things Jesus was doing. Not just that the woman was healed, but also the delight in realising that God is not a petty, unloving, hypocritical grump like these leaders had been. We've got to be real at this point as we read this passage, that we ourselves are also not immune from getting God all kind of mixed up and crazy in our minds. And often, sadly, it comes from us looking at God's leaders, looking at the leaders of God's church and seeing them make mistakes and mess up and misinterpret and mistreat and then just kind of copy-pasting that back onto God Himself. We, We do that. That's our tendency, which is why it is so important that we keep on coming back to Jesus, keep on coming back to the man Himself, God walking among us. Because when we do that, we get to see Jesus challenging this constant drift we have into thinking that being unloving and ungodlike is how we should treat each other. We need to ask questions of ourselves. If our structures, if our preferences kind of get in the way, stand as barriers between us being able to offer offer mercy and care to another person, Jesus wants to challenge that attitude. We are being called into a kingdom of delights. Into a kingdom where where the wonders of Jesus bring deep joy and deep satisfaction. And I really like where Jesus goes next. It's really interesting. We should expect that these delights that we get to experience will spread like crazy. They'll spread like crazy, but at the same time, in a very understated way. Have a look with me, verse 18. Then Jesus asked, what is the kingdom of God like? What shall I compare it to? It's like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his garden. It grew and it became a tree and and the birds perched in its branches. I love it when Jesus cracks out a good gardening metaphor, a good gardening image. And and this is the image he uses to help us us understand his kingdom. He says it's going to be like a big majestic tree. It's beautiful, right? Birds perching in the branches. If you have the joy of having a big tree in your backyard, you'll notice how joyful it is. We've got one at the top corner of our yard. We've just finished building a little platform around it so we can one day put a little flying fox in and and zoom from one side of the yard to the other. Big trees are delightful. Big trees are the best. But Jesus' point about big trees is that they don't start out that way. Trees, even the most majestic of them, start out as seeds. They start out small, they start out insignificant, they start out being not particularly noteworthy. But give it time, apply some patience, and that tree will grow, it'll spread, it'll end up changing everything where it's been planted. The kingdom of God is like that, says Jesus. Or or another illustration, to make the same point, this one is uh, for all you newly minted sourdough bakers out there. Jesus talks about the amazing power of yeast. Verse 20, again he asked, what shall I compare the kingdom of God to? It's like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 30 kilograms of flour until it worked through all the dough. Now, in my house, Alison's been baking sourdough. I should, I should say that she actually started it well before the pandemic, well before this current craze. What a woman. 
Uh, but I can remember the first time she started baking these loaves and, and watching her do it, taking this weird blob of mushy goo that smelt really funky and, and adding it into a bunch of flour and a bunch of water and give it a few days and out comes this beautiful loaf of bread. And my, my description to Alison was it feels like witchcraft, delicious, tasty, crusty witchcraft, but, but it's just weird how it works. And Jesus conjures up that image, the image of yeast, the image of leaven to describe the kingdom of God. A little bit of it can have a massive, changing, transformative impact on a whole lot of other stuff. The kingdom of God, the kingdom Jesus is calling us to belong to and find our delight in and find our home in, it's, it's like that kind of big tree. It's like that bread. It starts off small, but by the end it has massive significance. And it's really amazing when you think that when Jesus was first saying these words... The kingdom didn't look like much. We're talking a few healed people here and a few followers there. It certainly didn't look like much compared to the might of the Roman Empire. It certainly didn't look like much compared to the might of the Jewish religious systems around it. But, Jesus says, give it time and this kingdom, the kingdom of God, is going to change everything. It's going to transform everything. It's going to bring goodness to everything. It's going to bring delights to huge numbers of people. And we know that that's exactly what has happened. The fact that we are here in the other side of the planet 2,000 years later talking about Jesus, it says that something happened. The, the very fact that you and I can today still be delighting in Jesus, just like those first crowds did, something clearly happened. Clearly, the, the tree that started out small has grown and now we are able to perch in its branches as well. Clearly, the, the thing that started off so small and looking very vulnerable has, over time, come to have a huge impact, not being held back by geography, not being held back by time, leaping over every barrier that's supposedly been in its way. This is how God works. It's so easy to look at, look at things from our vantage point and say, yeah, of course Jesus would say that, but at the time, it must have seemed positively loopy for Jesus to say to his followers that his kingdom was going to end up changing everything. But he knew. He knew that this is how God works, that God has a knack of taking things that look really weak in the world's eyes and using them to do unimaginably good. Now, the Apostle Paul in, in 1 Corinthians 1 famously says that God deliberately uses weak things. And he does it deliberately to kind of confound and confuse human wisdom. We think that might and strength and power and control is the only way to get anything done. And Jesus says, just you watch and wait. The Jesus we're following brings delights. He brings real, true, deep joy. He brings it in his own time. He brings it in his own way. My hope is that this week you'll be able to take some time to stop and savour the delight that Jesus has brought your way. Have a good one. Thank you, Tom. That was delightful. Something we as Christians love to do is to pray, where we talk to a God that is listening. One of the other things we love to do is pray together, where we as a community pray and talk to a God that is listening to us not just to me. So I'm going to lead us in a prayer that's going to appear on the screen and I'd encourage you following along to speak it aloud yourself. The prayer is one of thanksgiving because even though there is much going on in the world that is not good, there is also much that is excellent and it's good to remember that. Please join me. Almighty God and merciful Father, we give you humble and hearty thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all people. We praise you for creating and sustaining us and for all the blessings of this life, but above all for your amazing love in redeeming the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, giving us grace and the hope of glory. Give us such a sense of all your goodness that we may be truly thankful and praise you, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by serving you in holy and righteous ways, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, 
to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honour and glory, now and forever. Amen. Carolyn Israel is going to lead us in more prayer. Oh, good morning, everyone. Um, this is I'm Carolyn Israel from the 8.30 service, and uh, I'm going to lead you in prayer this morning. So let's bow our heads and come before our Lord. Father God, we come before you again this morning as your church, scattered as we are physically, but together spiritually, to worship you for your great love for us and to thank you for being with us and in us through your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the gift of your Son, our Saviour Jesus, and that we have life in his name. From Psalm 90, verse 14, Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Dear Father God, we have the great privilege of being able to present our request to you and know that you hear us when we pray. Accept the prayers we now offer. Father, as this time of isolation continues, we pray that we will know your peace upon us and ask that you keep us safe. We know that this time will come to an end, so until then, please keep us trusting you and looking to Jesus. Dear Lord, we pray for all health professionals as they care for the sick and ask that you will protect them from contracting the virus. We thank you for their dedication and commitment as they continue to serve in hospitals, aged care facilities and our local doctors as well. We also pray for our police force, ambulance drivers and paramedics as they are so much in the front line of this, of this pandemic. Father, we pray for people who serve in shops and supermarkets and all people dealing with the public at this time. Surround them with your loving care and protection. Father God, we bring before you the people who have lost their jobs because of the coronavirus and particularly those who are struggling to pay rent and buy food. Please bring help to them and may the promised financial help from the government be forthcoming. We thank you for our government's wise leadership and for the assistant packages that have been put in place. Be with all relief agencies who are providing assistance and may people who can give generously to aid this help. Father, our hearts go out to people who have lost loved ones due to the virus. Comfort and sustain them, we pray, and may they look to you for help. We ask that many people may turn to you during this time of uncertainty, Lord. As people realise no one on earth has the power to stop this pandemic, may they look to the one who has all power and authority and holds all things in his hands. May they see Jesus in all his glory and turn their lives to him, our Saviour and our Lord. We pray, Father, for some members of our church family who need your, your hand upon them right now. We lift up to you Jeff and Lynn. Please be with them during this time of Jeff's illness. Give doctors wisdom as to the treatment that he should receive and restore Jeff to full health. Thank you, Lord, for this time we have spent together. We pray your blessing on every family watching this live stream service. Jesus said, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. We pray all these things through the wonderful name of Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. Amen.
that brings us to the end of the formal proceedings. Uh, church is over for this Sunday, or so I would say, except we have morning tea. Uh, you'll need to supply your own morning tea, uh, but I'm sure you'll be able to find some somewhere. And join us on Zoom. We're going to have a video call. Join us in. There's a link up on the website. If you search Central Villages into Google, it'll come up. Click the link uh, and there'll be a button there about the after church Zoom call. Press that and join us. We'll break up into little rooms. So you won't have to be in front of everyone. And it's a great opportunity to hang out and just catch up with one another and share a bit of our lives. So please join me and the others and uh, I'll see you there. Thanks.